Last week, the subject was brought up as a carryover from before, given the, the pastoral vacancy uh, situation. Uh, what, what, would you, what would you as a congregation, what would you like in a, in a pastor? And the, dis, the, the distilling answer in the end was somebody who is faithful to scripture. Of course, the number of ordained guys on the synodical roster that are going to advertise they are not faithful to scripture, that's going to be a really, really, really small, small group. It, yeah. uh, so, but I thought I would turn it around a little bit uh, to give you uh, another perspective on the subject of a, of a congregation looking for a pastor to come and be the pastor of your congregation. So here's, here is the question. Last week's was what kind of a what do you want in a pastor? What kind of pastor do you want? What do you think the pastor would be looking for from you as a congregation or you individually? What's a pastor looking for? Support. Support? What kind of support? Support. Specifics in that are always uh, good. I think willing to, to hear God's word, study, and follow as you lead it. Okay. Uh, and there, there's always a, for me, I'm, I'm, since I'm up here, I guess I get to give my opinion. There's, there, there, there are two, two sides of this, I think, as a pastor. One is that appreciate that when you give God's word that people say we're that's what we believe and we're going to follow that the other side of that however is also just a little bit of following is a kind of a passive activity and if everybody is passive in that sense then you have a lot of things that aren't getting done because everybody's just busy being passive and it turns out that in, in, in churches of all kinds of sizes, turns out things need to be done. Who knew? Uh, now, this probably shifts into some uh, administrative structure question or assignment relative to stewardship or, you know, this old time, talent, treasure, all that kind of stuff. But, but here's, in my experience, tell me if it's different for you otherwise, but in my experience, what people value and what, what's really important to people, that's where they put their time, that's where they put their effort, and that's where they put their money. It's just the way that it is. And my experience also is if people don't find that sense of value that they're going to uh, connect with in those ways that the way that just this doesn't sound nice how do, how do people vote on these matters ultimately they leave if it's not going to be the way I think it's going to be and I'm not going to invest myself in it I'm, gonna, I'm just I'm going to quit coming that's my experience people, people vote with their feet that's just is that, is that, do you know what I'm saying? Is that something you're familiar with? It's a kind, it's a kind of a do what I, do what I want or else, which is a kind of a, kind of a cocked hammer on a 45 kind of an answer. Uh, but it, it, it can happen. And now, it's, again, it's a matter of perspective, whether that's perceived as valid and justified or invalid and not justified. And that depends on, who, who you ask, uh, and it, 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 that depends on what circumstances are, arise, and some of that comes from, so if you imagine yourself, I don't know how they do this anymore, because things have changed. It used to be, back in the day, 
long before any of you were born, when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Back in the day, if congregations and, and pastors pro tem uh, were going to be getting together, if there was a conversation and question asked, it, it was you were sinning against the Holy Spirit because if you believe this is the way it was supposed to be, you should, you should just follow the Holy Spirit's lead. That's not the way that it is anymore. Uh, only takes one or two lawsuits to change that kind of thinking. So now it's a lot more of a, of a conversation and a dialogue between, and there are all kinds of papers that give, uh, what are the, the documents the congregation gives? Uh, there's an SIT uh, situation, something or other, an MRI, no, that's a, all kinds of documents. So they ask questions now. Uh, oh, How does Pastor X uh, lead worship services? Right by the book, by the hymnal, or not? For me, I'm, I'm still making an adjustment because the, uh, the, the last hymnal I used for any length of time was, was the, not a Missouri Synod hymnal, it was the the, the Department of Veteran Affairs, well, Department of Defense uh, Armed Forces hymnal, which is surprisingly not like a Lutheran hymnal. Who knew? Not everybody in the military is a Lutheran. What? Anyway, different hymnal, different liturgies, different everything. Uh, but anyway, uh, so uh, the, 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 the pastor will maybe want to know or have a certain set of expectations as to how do worship services go here and here you have a, a you have a Saturday night chocolate service you have an eight o'clock vanilla service and you have a when's the next 10 30 strawberry service and they're all going to be about Jesus Jesus and Jesus but the liturgies aren't the same I get are the hymns all the same probably kind of not probably some uh and so for a guy coming from out of town, it's kind of like a lot of different liturgical stuff going on. Um, uh, and and, and uh, where do you, I'm the new guy, uh, uh, interviewing, you're interviewing me, I'm interviewing you. Where do you think I should stand when I'm doing the liturgy? I mean, these are issues that cause people to leave the church. Should I stand on the back side or should I stand on the congregation side? Because it's a freestanding altar. I'll bet nickels to donuts in the uh, Trinity Lutheran Church that used to be on the corner. Is that the right direction? Yeah. The brick, red brick one with the top. Right. I'll, I'll bet you nickels to donuts the altar in that church was like this up against the wall. Yeah, it was. Right? Which is the way God meant it to be. Hmm. Because that's the only way it was. And then somebody, some bunch of radical Lutherans, no, nah, it wasn't, we didn't do much about that. It was a lot of Lutherans following Vatican II. So in the early 60s, the church layout and design became different. Freestanding altar, a church more in a wraparound. A lot of things cha changed. Uh, communion. How did it used to be? Come up and kneel and You'd come up and kneel at the communion rail, and what did the ordained guy do? How did he do it? Gave you the wafer, and then came back around and gave you the money. How how was the how was the cup served? Oh, I t common, common sink common. sink common cup. <clears throat> now that was that was back in the days when dinosaurs roamed the earth. So by, by way of how does this work in pastoral practice? Yeah, you remember because you, you and I we were we were we were we were, we were riding dinosaurs back in those days. Uh, so a, as an example, as a reference point, some people have no idea what we were just talking about, and some people do, and kind of whoa. So here's how this works out in in a clinical setting in a hospital. You're in a hospital bed, and you want to receive the Lord's Supper. 
and I'm the hospital chaplain or your pastor coming to visit you, but there are all kinds of restrictions in a, the intensive care unit that you're in. And so, anybody been in that situation? How do you give communion to somebody who is all hooked up to all kinds of stuff? Coherent, cognizant, but how do you do that? This is a how question. And the how is, this is how I do it, fortunately for you, I'm correct. You would... You've got the host that's, the, say, the size of a nickel or a quarter, right? You break it into a fraction of that. And then you have the cup over here, the individual cup probably, and that fraction of the host, and you dip the host into the cup, and then you administer host, the bread and the wine, the body and blood. Eat and drink. This is the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of that's That's how that would be done. M at using the absolute most minimal. Because what if that person can't swallow? What if I give them a whole wafer and they choke to death? Hey, guess, who's going, guess, guess who's never going in that hospital again and will have to face the legal repercussions of causing a patient's death? So you have to be very careful about how doing this. In a practical application, we just went through this COVID thing. So a, a church called me up and said, we had a guy who was supposed to come and he can't come. This was about an hour before the service. I said, can I come? Sure. So I went up to the, the, the church and they said, uh, we're going to video it and there'll be a half a dozen people here and then we're going to have people come in uh, for communion and how do they do that? And I said, no problem, done this all the time. And so I said, where's your common cup? And where's the host? Dip, eat. How close do you have to get? Oh, maybe, I don't know, two and a half feet, whatever my arm. And so there's that distance thing and everything. But some people came in, <gasps> almost turned around and went out. Common cup? We can't do the common cup. Before it was, we can't have communion without the common cup. So you see, all of these things change and one thing that Lutherans are not really good at is changing anything we don't change any, not only do we not change anything we don't even throw anything away you know how come I know that because you know what's under all those mailboxes that are back there I do Take a guess. All of the old, old hymnals that you used to have are now stored under there. So uh, a, a great wind could come. That cabinet's going nowhere because it's got 5,000 pounds of books stored in the bottom. Lutherans can't throw away hymnals. You can't burn books. That sounds really bad. So what do you do? We do what most Lutherans do. We store all that stuff because, because it takes up floor space and we need to use it for something. No. We, so, so a pastor by walking around, you can tell a lot by a church by what you see when you walk around. Of, or when I walk around and I open up cabinets and find out, oh, 5,000 really old hymnals. What does this mean? It means we don't throw away old stuff. Old stuff stays. Like you and me, old stuff, we stay. Ooh. Boy, you really know how. Ooh, thank you very much. I very seldomly turn down coffee because that would be like a sin. I had to bring it up. Well, it's good that you bring up these highly sensitive issues because here's, here's where. Here's where the, and again, I've been out of congregational stuff for so long. I was in, I was in clinical hospital stuff. When I finished with that and re retired, it was kind of like, what happened to the Lutheran church? I have no idea. Uh, when I would do chapel services in the VA, it looked just like this, because this is what I wore. But now, 
You can see a lot of this online, and I don't know what all has been happening here, but I'll give you an example. In my first parish, it was a dual parish, and it was from over here to over there, and this service ended, if it started at 8.30, it ended at 9.30, and the service over there started at 10. Okay, and I had one set of vestments. Why? Because that's all the money I had. I bought one. How long do you think, how, how long was I there, you think, before I, le- before I forgot to take the vestments in my hurry to get over to the other church because it had snowed two feet and were the roads clear and I had to hurry up and get there because Lutherans don't, they want the service to start on time. So it wasn't very long, actually. So I drove over there and I left my vestments behind. So all I had was my deluxe high quality suit. Well, not very high quality, but it was a suit. And I realized as I'm getting out of the car to go into this church and I'm grabbing for stuff that it's not there. So I don't have my vestments. I only had one set. I had to have them at the first church because that's where the first service was. But they were still there. And inside the building, 200 Lutherans, all expecting their pastor to walk out dressed just like this. And then this young knucklehead walked out wearing a suit. And the gaze was, oh no, what are we going to do today? And I said, well, here are the options. You can wait. I'll drive back over and get them and then come back and we'll start in about 40 minutes. Or I'll just conduct this service wearing my suit because Yes, I forgot my vestment. Okay, we'll line up with throw stones later, but right now I've got a worship service. And everybody said, eh, that's okay. After they got over the initial shock, they thought it was okay because it was exceptional because I'm a knucklehead. I forgot to pick stuff up and carry it. That's a pretty hard thing to remember to do, but I was able to do it. And it turns out nobody quit the church because I wore a suit. But now these days, that would be, hey, the guy wore a suit. Now ordained guys even in the Missouri Senate. I don't know if you've had it here, but I've, I've seen pastors wearing blue jeans and your, your nice cat dressed just like you up front for a formal worship service. And people are in the pews and I haven't seen one with cutoffs and sandals, but maybe, I haven't been to Hawaii either. Maybe that's how they do that there. And I'm not talking about what you do on that Sunday when you have a worship service outside kind of stuff. I'm talking about what happens in the church proper. Again, it's a, it's, a, it's a different day. And in terms of how does a pastor dress, you can get away with stuff now that before was, was, was something that would cause people to gasp. And I asked myself the question when I came down here too, I said, I wonder how they expect me to, to dress. Because I, I, I don't have, I probably once had a stole that my wife made at the seminary, a red one. <clears throat> I don't have any stoles, not one other than that one. This is technically a tippet. It's black, I wear it all the time. It's my uh, Department of Defense, Ministry of Armed Forces tippet. That's the one I wear. How many have I got? One, how many, that's the one I wear. But uh, I wonder if that's gonna fly down there. I don't know, well I'm gonna try it anyway because it matches your tie, it's black, Matches my shoes, how mad can people get? But I don't really know because these things are so pivotal to people. So pivotal. People are concerned. Your question is right spot on. People are concerned about what people wear. Sometimes more so than they don't care what comes out of the guy's mouth. But as long as he's dressed the way we think he should be dressed, And by the way, your note to me that I should dress just like you with wearing sandals, contrary to the note that you sent that I should I should wear all of these this full regalia and even and more. The church I filled in here before this, they had they had a closet in the pastor's office. As as wide as this window, full of vestments and formal all kinds of genuflecting kind of stuff. This, I'm looking kind of casual by ordained guys' circles, but pretty ritzy for other guys' ordained guys' circles. So it's it's a live question because how that translates is 
Well, what's a pastor looking for in a, uh, in a congregation? Are you concerned? What, how are you going to respond if the guy shows up wearing brown shoes? Well, that's him, though. That's classic. It depends on who you ask. But women can't wear white after, after, after Labor Day. Yes, sir. Well, I remember back in the day that uh, we, I was in Bethlehem, Morristown. We had a pastor, and I was, let's say, 9, 10, 11 ish in there. And I, I think I remember it being his one of his first, if it wasn't his first sermon, Hoffman. Frank Hoffman, pastor at Hoffman, was there for 20, 30 years. But anyway, one of his first ones, he was up in the pulpit, and we're all watching him, you know, and um, his sermon notes fell over the front of the pulpit. Mm -hmm. And then he was going to either pick them up and he misstepped again. And then he got back into the pulpit and he said, judge not. And his whole sermon was on, he had planned that. Oh, yeah. And since he was going to be the new pastor, mm -hmm. he was going to give the um, congregation a little slack. He wouldn't judge them if they didn't judge oh, him so see? much. There, there's a good Something little thing. Something like that. Yep. Now, that stuff would be so, so, it, and, so it's kind of a, I've kind of tried to do the same thing. Because my batting average with this microphone is I'm, I'm kind of, I'm two out of six, I think. Because this, this microphone switch, this, this, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you don't. This little thing, we are negotiating terms of agreement. This thing. It's not like the one that I've been used to using. Why should I have to change the way a microphone? Anyway, this one has two switches, and you have to use one, and then you turn on the other. And sometimes I get it right, and sometimes I move it in the wrong direction. And you, and you know what? So I'm out there telling you, judge not, because I'm trying to figure out the switch on this crazy thing. When what I'm, what I'm not, what I'm not really telling you is I'm altogether inept, although that could be quite true. What I'm really doing is probing to see who gets their knickers in a knot over whether this guy who just drove almost an hour to get down here, if people are excited because I'm trying to get the microphone right, and you could be. But I'm looking to see, what is it, what is it, as a pastor, I'm looking to see, what do you guys really, what really, what really drives your train? Makes you want to throw coal on the fire. What do you get, what do you get excited about? And if you get excited about whether, how, how well are my shoes polished, by the way? Whether I'm wearing these, the vestments the right way, the right color. Uh, because these are the things that get people Pretty excited because everybody has a certain set of expectations. What's God's set of expectations? That would, if, if that would be relevant. The message may be trying to look through whatever it is the devil is trying to get at you. Because, well, this is right. Remember the message that he's given, and it's for you to accept and use and apply. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, yep. And then you get another pastor that's the place that you're talking about. Yeah, and, and, and so, and this isn't a new issue. Uh, I, I remember discussions about this kind of stuff at the seminary. One, one guy, is a student, classmate of mine, wrote a 30-page paper on this, what, what the dimensions of an altar should be. I mean, and he got credit for it. I mean, but these are the things. Does this count as an altar? I don't know. It could be. Uh, but but you're, you're right. And so the discussion is, or could be, that now, now that this is yesterday was my first day with, with the altar and the pulpit and the lectern up there before it was a cactus and an arch. So, I mean, it's like... <laughs> Last week was the first time I'd ever preached from a cactus. I'm just saying, but and 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 so 
the, the whole setup, the altar. Just what's, what is the Lutheran definition of an, of an altar? We tend to go back as Lutherans and say, well, or at least we used to, I don't know anymore. It used to be, we'd say, well, what was an altar in the Bible and what was it used for? And the answer would be the sacrifice of the lamb or the animal or the grain, whatever. So altar and sacrifice go together. But we, we have different names for it, an altar and different functions. Is it an altar that focuses on sacrifice? Or is it the Lord's table where I can put my coffee cup? How would you feel if I dressed like, you asked about dressed, I'm all dressed. What if I walk in with my bulletin and a cup of coffee? And I walk in with my bulletin and a cup of coffee and I set my cup of coffee on the altar up front. All in favor, say aye. Oh, wait a minute, judge not, I mean, come on, you see what I'm saying? We all have a sense of, is it, is it a table? The Lord's table, the Lord served Holy, Holy Communion, was served from a dinner table. Is it a dinner table? Is it a place for sacrifice? Is it where the ordained guy leaves all his notes? And with, with different ordained guys, guess what you get? Different answers. <laughs> and so, all right, here's, here's, your, here's your blind taste test. What's on the altar in the center right now? What do you think is there? Tick, tick. What's that? Uh, yep. Uh, is that because you remember it or are you just guessing? I'm just, I don't know. 50-50. Because it's, it's me. Not previous guys, but it's me. What used to be up there was this really big, thick book. But what that, and that's still up there. It's the one laying flat to the right. When I read the prayer for the day, right in here that says prayer for the day, read that right out of the book. That's the, that's the altar book. Not a Bible, it's an altar book. It's for the ordained guy. Here's all of this, here's the stuff, the three-year readings and all that. That's why it's so thick. That sits there and it's got the prayer of the day and the readings and all of this stuff and it sits there. And my next week it'll still be sitting there but it'll turn a page but you'll never know. But what I did is I took that book that was in the center on the book rack in the altar, I took it off the book stand, moved it to the side and laid it flat. And then got what I guess is probably the altar Bible holder from your previous building, I'm just guessing because I found it in the back, put that on the center of the altar and found a really, somebody else found a really big Bible and that's a Bible that sits on the center of the altar. See the symbolism there? So when you walk into a church, your center doors and your center aisle is supposed to call your attention to the altar. The cross is up there. The altar is down here. And in a in, in a sola scriptura church, I like a Bible. That's just me. Other ordained guys will put coffee cups there and other books and other things. But for me, it's, it serves as a table because I keep a pen up there because if I ask for prayers and you say pray for Billy Bob, then I can write that down. That's an old thing I just have been doing for years in the VA because everybody came in with their own prayers. So I use it as a table to keep notes and to figure out where I am next in this new church with the different lighting and the pulpit that's on the, it's on the wrong side, by the way. No. The other church, it was on this side. Oh, when are you Lutherans all going to get together? Shouldn't the pulpit be on the same side? The answer is, no, nah, that would be way too easy. Anyway, I'm being facetious, of course. But, but the, the idea being, it depends on what your, what your sense of worship formality, people, and place, what do you want it to say? When Jesus says uh, in the gospel lesson and talks about, you see the clouds in the morning, well, that tells you what weather's coming your way. Wind coming from the south, that tells you what the, what 
the temperature is going to be later. And when you look at your church, when you see an altar with a cross uh, built into the wall and a Bible front and center, I'm asking the old Lutheran question, what does this mean? And I'm saying Christ, God's word, front and center, period. Not every ordained guy wants it set up that way. And, it, and this doesn't come inscribed on the back side of the Ten Commandments. This is me. Because I'm trying to... There, there's, a, there's a visual message there. So when I'm preaching from the pulpit, but I'm reading something to you that I don't want you to think this is something I'm just saying. I want you to know this is what God's Word says. What I do is... I don't necessarily just read it. I could, but I pick it up. Because I want you to see, I'm not making this stuff, it's right out of the book. If you don't like it right out of the book, that's another matter. But this, is, this isn't something I'm just saying, I'm reading it out of the book. So when you're sitting in church, you know what you're getting? Stuff right out of the book. Here's the owner's manual, this is what he said. If you don't like it, take it up with management. I just work here. And it's a temporary gig. What's that? Exactly. There's a stone out there and we should throw it at somebody. So I want you to know that the, the Bible that I use up front, it's not even the official Bible of the translation of the Synod. And even worse, I don't care. Because I've had that one for 500 years and I'm going to keep using it. And if people don't like it, I don't care. That's the one I'm used to. Why? Because in my head, I've got the layout on the page. I know where it is. And I can understand the words and... Sin had got it wrong and I'm right. That's the bottom line. The main thing is to keep the main thing as the main thing. What a pastor, what I'd be looking for is, what does a congregation think is the main thing? What's the main thing in a worship service? What's the main thing in a sermon? What's the main thing with how worship services are conducted? Well, what, what, is, the, what is the main thing? What's it all about? And... Uh, when, when, when you look into the building, into the, the sanctuary, into the chancel, then you can kind of, you're, you're reading the clouds. You're reading the symbols. What? Did anybody notice that really tall stand for the book, for the Bible this morning? You, what, 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 what came through your mind when you saw that? I wonder where it came from. wonder where that came from. I saw it last night. I, yeah, yeah. I put it up. I put it up uh, the day before, but it looks kind of tall, a little, yeah. a little taller than most that I've seen. Also, is missing a screw. But hey, all it has to do is sit there. Uh, did you know? Found this out. That's not the original altar Bible from this church at all. I've, so far, do you know how many original altar Bibles I've found? Three. Two, Auf Deutsch. I thought, I could bring those back in. <laughs> That'd be kind of complicated. Partly because the covers are falling apart. They're wooden covers wrapped in leather, and the bindings are in Polish kaputski. But the last one, the third one is... It, the cover is also in really bad shape, but it's in English. I'll bet again, nickels to donuts, that when the change happened from that building to this building, from an altar up against a wall to a freestanding, I'll bet you that's when that altar Bible went into a closet. Uh, not saying that's problematic. Don't don't know. Uh, I wonder if there's such a thing as a liturgical lazy Susan so you can put the Bible up there and spin it around if you're at the other side. I don't know. I just think this stuff up and then somebody from CPH will say, no, we're not going to make that. Shut up. Go back to work. But, anyway. so it, but it, it depends on where you're going to stand. When the altar is right here, the options are pretty limited. When it's freestanding, you can be on one side or the other, which goes into the into the significance in liturgical worship, where does the ordained guy stand and why is he standing there? What side of the altar 
is signified. Go ahead. Hmm? Right. What? right side or the right as in correct? The, the right side of the altar? Okay. Faith. Hey, hey, no cross on your altar. You don't have a cross on the altar, do you? No. No. The, the, the cross is where? On the back of the chancel that takes over the entire chancel area. The wall. Your cross is your wall in your wall. But when, but when you do a freestanding altar, if you put something tall like a cross right in the center, and then the pastor is standing on the back chancel wall side, then he's got this cross right there. Okay, it doesn't, visually it doesn't work out well. So then you have to, some churches suspend a cross, this one built into the wall, but that's what happens when you do this reconfigure of design. But in this kind of a, a, a structure, even when you have a freestanding altar, what's the, as in the definition of altar, what's its function? When, when the pastor is standing on this side and he's doing, why am I turning around all the time? What does that signify? There, all of this is by design. This is not flooping stance. Well, it could be. When you face us, God is speaking to us. When you face the altar, you're bringing petitions to come out. Right. So when I'm, when I'm looking at you in the congregation, and I'm saying, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I'm saying, oh, by the way, your sins are forgiven, I'm talking on God's behalf to you. And when it's the prayer of the day, I'm facing this way because the function of the pastor is to act and speak on behalf of the congregation to God. Because in the flow of the worship, you could do this with the hymnal. Don't use a pen. If you do, don't tell them I said this. But when you take a look at the liturgy, oh, we can use this right here. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. I read that. Was I facing you or the altar? I was facing you. Then when we began the confession, I turned around this way, and we made our confession because that's addressed to God. We're making the confession. So the flow, the direction changes. And so the position of the pastor relative to the worship that's going on also tells a message, I'm talking to God for you or I'm talking on your behalf to God. That's supposed to be the symbolism that is inherent in that. So we could turn it the other way around and I could, uh, from the pulpit, preach from this side and preach to the back wall. How would that work? Loses something. But you see, all of a sudden, body language tells a whole story. And these are things that pastors are looking for from a congregation. How do you guys, how do, you guys do things here? Because wherever, if, if he's at a congregation somewhere, you know how they do it? It's kind of like this, but not. And so, how, how is it going to work to make that a, adjustment? I don't know if I told you, I saw, I saw a guy online, the other, he's a Missouri Synod guy. You know how they start the service? We could do that here. Uh, 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 an assistant comes up, uh, this would be the oh, assistant comes up over here to the side and rings the, and chimes the bell. And that's the way, everybody pay attention, the worship service is going to start. And then the pastor comes out, the very same guy, and then he then he genuflects like that, and then he turns and then we begin. What do you think? Huh? Huh? See, all or, or you can get somebody who shows up in 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 sandals, white socks, cut off shorts, and uh, and a sweatshirt. That all that stuff is out there, all of it. And, and they're all Missouri Synod guys probably too. So what, what pastors are looking for in a congregation, what's, what's the stuff that's really important to you? 
And if you don't tell him, he's just going to have to guess. I'm doing a lot of guessing because I just I've only been here for two weeks, and I've only been working with that chancel set up the way that it is for 12 hours. So a lot of it is how does this, how does this all play out in Poughkeepsie? Uh, because the way, the way that the church is set up and the way it functions is a, an expression of how the congregation views worship. And worship is something that Lutherans, we're, we're big on worship. And, and, and we are sometimes hesitant to be, uh, well, we know, we kind of know what we want, and we kind of know when we see it, that we, if we don't like it or not, not exactly what, sure it, what, what it is. Page 5 and page 15 seemed a little bit narrow. I mean, come on, isn't there something? Yeah. This, the current hymnal has only about 30 or 40 liturgies in there, uh, so we've got plenty. Um, uh, so the question is, what are we going to do? How are we going to do that? Because these are all, uh, from the outside coming in as a pastor for the guy that you call, these are, he, uh, he's going to look at, look, at, look at your bulletins because your bulletins tell the story. How does Trinity Lutheran Church worship? What's it like? And the answer is, well, here's hard documentation. This is the data. So uh, you can read the newsletters. That's what we're like. You can read the bulletins. This is what we're like. Uh, he can, now these days, knucklehead me, you can watch the congregation worship services online or listen on the radio. How is it going there? Now the radio, that doesn't tell you as much about interaction. Uh, and up front, uh, on, a, on a live streaming or just streaming, it's, it's, uh, you're kind of seeing how the guy does it who's up there and that kind of is a tell, depending upon who the guy is that's up there. Uh, but but I'm, not a, I'm not a bell chiming, genuflecting guy. For the last umpteen years, I was dealing with people who couldn't get out of their wheelchair. Except for when we, we had Clown Sunday. Not kidding. That was a new one. No seminary preparation for that. Or when the International Order of Cooties would all show up. You guys know what that is? You do? Yep. Where everybody sh There's a visitation, hospital visitation. They all show up dressed like cooties. You know the old board game? What was that called? Was it just called cootie? It was called cootie. What was it? It was called cootie. Cootie. There you go. Uh, so try, try getting, try getting uh, super liturgical when everybody's got a red rubber nose on their face. Just saying, what, happened? what if we handed out red rubber noses? Would you guys all wear red, red rubber noses in church? We'll get that over our wall and start wearing rubber noses. Start rubber nose thing. We all want to that. Hey, see? You guys want, to, you guys want to, some liturgical flexibility. Try, try, try genuflecting with a red rubber nose on. Uh, what, what Not going to happen, by the way. Just... Uh, Didn't didn't know that. The first, uh, think so, but I don't know. Yeah, but it's kind of one of a hmm. You know, if I do that, somebody's going to see me online, right? Oh yeah. They're going to think, look at that knucklehead. He doesn't even know how to get dressed up for a worship service. What's the church coming to? So it's so then I have to make a decision. How do we how do we do this? Because a couple things are going on. You realize, of course, every worship service that you have, and you should know this by virtue of the internet and the radio, if just not Theology 101, every worship service you have here is a public worship service, open to the public. So every time whoever the pastor is comes out, he's making a public statement. Every time the worship service follows this, that's a public statement. Come on in. This is how we do church. And you get this and that and the other thing and everything says 
Everything communicates something to somebody. Everything. 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 Here, what does this communicate? This is a kind of a trick question, but not. What kind of cross is this? I don't hang it around my neck cross. Yeah, pectoral cross. But what style? Celtic. Celtic cross. This is not the synodically approved official pectoral cross for ordained guys in the Missouri Synod. Not even close. Well, it's kind of close. But I wear it anyway for two reasons. One, that my wife bought it and said, here, I got this for you. <laughs> And two is because she bought it for me because our family heritage is Irish, Celtic cross. Which is better, by the way, than this synodical thing. But that's just, I'm, I'm biased, but I'm here today. And, and, and so uh, whether somebody is wearing this kind of cross, that tells you something. Do you have, do you, would you know that? No. But you know what? Works for me. All, all things communicate something to somebody. And whether I dress this way or that way or, or turn to the left or turn to the right. Even at the, the seminary teaching, which way should you turn when you, face, when you go to face the altar? And the official answer is, see, all of these things, these things get discussed at graduate school level. Which way should you turn? What? Which way should you turn? Probably the easiest way to get around it. That's, that's one. You know which way I turn? And here's why. Here's the deep theological reason. I always turn to the right. And if I'm good, when I turn back, I always turn to the right. You know why? Because when you're in the army, you always turn to the right. <laughs> Unless you're told to turn to the left, you have to turn to the right. So I have that branded in my brain. Because if you don't turn to the right, then you have a rifle on the back of your hands on black asphalt in July doing push-ups. So that's why I always turn to the right. Why? Because I got tired of turning to the left and having to do push-ups. You know what happens when you have a rifle on your hands on a July day on black asphalt after you're up? Now they would go to jail for doing that. In those days, they thought it was fun. Anyway, so these are all backgrounds as to how things are done, but congregations come, uh, pastors coming into congregations, they're looking at people and how do you do things and what's significant. That you preserved your windows from the old church, that tells the story. I think that's kind of great myself. Um, so, like, uh, you've heard the expression for police, read the streets. Like the gospel lesson, read the sky, read the signs. Pastors coming in, they're going to read the congregation. I was asked to preach at a congregation in northern Wisconsin once. And I said, I don't want to come. I got other stuff to do. Come up here. We don't, uh, uh, anyway, so I went up there. And I got ready to have this worship service, and I said, I just wore a clerical collar and a sweater. Because I was kind of upset, because I said, I told you I didn't want to come here. Then you, you just mailed a ticket to me. Okay. So, A, I wasn't in a good mood. B, they didn't do what I told them to do. And C, I felt obliged to do it because they already spent a couple hundred dollars on a ticket. And D, I didn't have my vestments with me because I was out of town at the time. Anyway, so I showed up, and the guy said, the guy said where are your vestments? I said, I didn't bring any. He's like, well, now what are we going to do? I said, probably call off church. But I, he said, he's, so he went into his closet, and he, and, he, and, he, and he brought out his old vestments. And these, were, these were white, and they were so old that they were turning yellow. They were dirty and yellow, from age, not brown and yellow, browning and turning yellow, like fabric does, especially white. So he said, well, here, you can wear this. And I said, I tried to be nice. I said, no, thanks. Well, you can't walk out of the sacristy where you get vested and go out in public for a worship service and not wear vestments and be a Lutheran at the same time. <laughs> but I did anyway because I said, I'm not wearing that stuff, man. I don't, it, whether it fits me, I'm not wearing it. It's old and yellow. I think you should burn it myself. And the guys, anyway. How long, how much longer after that do you think I heard about that? 
well, actually a little bit more. <laughs> it was, it was kind of like, whoa, that's way over the line. But not for me. But different people draw different lines in different places. And it has to do with each congregation has her own identity. Each congregation has her own way of doing things. And I'm not saying these are right, these are wrong. These are just the way things are, are done. And, and there are lines, as we, uh, the object lesson, the children's lesson earlier pointed out, such as, again, once, a hundred years ago, and we invited, I don't know if I told you, we invited people over from the congregation to our house for dinner. And people sat at the, my wife put out the food and the potatoes, and the people, they were, all of them were German background people. <laughs> They sat there at the table and they looked at each other and they're kind of like, now what do we do? And I thought, well, what, what's going on? And the answer is, I have no clue. So we sat there and we sat there and my wife is, you know, she's starting to, well, what did we do wrong? And the answer is, and then one nice lady says, well, let me explain to you how this works. <laughs> She says, where, where our family comes from in, in Germany, we eat yellow potatoes. Not red. Well, these were white. You know what we do with white potatoes? We feed them to the hogs. Oh, jeez. So you know what we just did? We told, the, we told the German people in our congregation, we're going we're gonna to feed you the same slop that we feed the hogs with. Because, because my wife served white potatoes, mashed potatoes. Like, how would we know? Now, the people were very, 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 very gracious. You know what they did? They sat at the table and at, ate white potatoes. But the pastor and his wife gave them pig food. Got two minutes? I'm just saying. So the, it, how would I know that? My family background is Irish. We were just glad to have food. Uh, and, and so a pastor coming in, what's he looking for? He's looking for the identity of the con I think looking for the identity of the congregation. Who are you? What are you like? Are you nice? Or are you nice between... 10, 15, and noon, or, or, or not? What are, you, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna not do? What if he dresses the wrong way? What if he says the wrong thing? What if he, ser what if he invites you over and serves white potatoes to you? What's gonna happen? The answer is, he doesn't know, but he's looking to find out, because he doesn't wanna start World War III, but you can, you can almost do that by serving the wrong food. It can work the other way. The guy who was my successor uh, sh showed up and, and, and they were, you can only eat really, really, really healthy food people, by golly. So German meat and potatoes is going to be a So when they were, you want to see how things can go south? So when they were invited over to a German family, and how much food was on the table when the pastor and his wife showed up? enough to feed the fifth army. But you know what they did when they showed up for dinner? They brought their own. Whoa. How long, how long did that relationship last? You see, because this is like walking on, walking on ice. You don't know how thick the ice is. Even things like things around, around food. So it's a, a sensitive kind of a thing, and it's, it's not hard to get it wrong. It's, it's tricky to get it right because expectations differ. The operational premise in the catechism says to put the best construction on everything. But let's not jam up 